going on, Vinyl Community? Welcome to another video with The Record Spinner. In today's video, I'm going to be doing a vinyl haul showcasing all of the records that I acquired within the month of March this year in 2024. And let me tell you, I think this was one of the finest months as of recently for vinyl finds. We have the newest offering from Ace Frehley. We have some 70s prog, analog productions pressings of Bad Company, the newest releases from Zach Sabbath and Kaiser Chiefs, and much, much much more it's about to go deep so without further ado sit back relax and enjoy the latest finds okay so where do we begin for this haul well i'm going to start off with a phrase that i think will be a dead giveaway for the first set of records i'm going to show you guys ace is back and he told you so Yes, I am talking about the newest offering from Ace Frehley. 10,000 Volts, the original guitarist in Kiss, the original Spaceman. And dare I say it, this album might be his best studio record since the 1978 um, solo album that he did back when he was in Kiss. Is that sacrilege to say? I really don't know. Uh, Ace has been very prolific uh, as of lately, putting out tons of albums of original material as well as covers albums, and all of which are generally pretty decent, but this album just has a little bit of sparkle on it that just makes it shine, and it's thanks to uh, Steve Brown of Trickster for being in the producer's chair and kind of reinvigorating Ace with some fresh input and making this album as great as it is. It has been getting a lot of love and listens on my turntable, and um, I cannot get enough of it. I, this is definitely going to be either number one for me or in my top five like best albums of 2024. I'm just going to say that right there. Uh, but if you are a vinyl collector, you will know that uh, uh, Monarch Heavy had a field day when it came to the vinyl variants of this particular album. Because last I counted, there was about 15 different versions. And that's not factoring in all the European exclusives. Basically, once a color sold out on the web store, then they pressed up another. Once that sold out, then they did another. There was the indie retail, the Sam Ash retail exclusive for the signing, yada, yada. Um, this right here um, is the first splatter version that was made available online, which I will showcase in a second. Here's the artwork. Cool sort of cartoonish sort of imagery here. Nice printed inner sleeve photo collage here with all the lyrics. And this pressing is pressed on clear vinyl with red, blue, and silver splatter vinyl, which looks really, really solid. And of course, because when it comes to variants of colors and covers, I should say, um, I can't just stop myself with uh, with one copy, which, by the way, that first splatter version was limited to 1730. And then I also copped this version, which is just a entirely uh, different album cover, a bit kind of basic, with just a black background and the silver design and text. And it's literally quite the same across the board. It's the exact same contents throughout. This is uh, limited to 750. Both of these are uh, sold out on the on the uh, website, and this is pressed on silver vinyl as well. Um, unfortunately, I did miss out on getting the Walking on the Moon and Cherry Medicine uh, variants. Those come with both different colored vinyl as well as different covers, which look really cool. Um, but when one sold out, I couldn't, you know, drive myself nuts and just get one. I wanted to get both together, but you know what? Two copies is better than none, and it's an album that's going to be getting a lot more spinning action on my turntable. Fantastic album for Mace. Okay, so here is a duo of legal bootleg type releases. Um, last month, I showcased some Genesis ones, and now I'm going to shine a light on another progressive rock band that played such an integral role in my musical upbringing, and that is Yes. And the release that I'm going to be showcasing is Boston Garden, the New England Broadcast 1974 Volume 1 as well as, of course, Volume 2. Now, this was recorded live during the Relayer Tour, so this lineup consists of Steve Howe, Chris Squire, John Anderson, Alan White, as well as keyboard player 
Patrick Mraz. Relayer is known for its kind of dabbling in the world of jazz fusion. And with this show, they basically play all of Relayer, along with most of Close to the Edge, side four of Topographic Oceans, and then it rounds off with an encore of Roundabout. So if you want full-on grand epic yes uh, I would say this show is definitely one to seek out. And it sounds fantastic, too. This was actually broadcasted on the King Biscuit Flower Hour. So it is of really good quality. If you know those uh, broadcast recordings, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Packaging is pretty much the same across the board. The only difference being the color of the logo. Uh, no Roger Dean landscapes to be seen here. But we do have a cool era-appropriate photo with Patrick Mraz. And then, of course, when you open it up, you have Rick Wakeman playing keyboards these releases can never really be too right but there's also a nice little write-up talking about the show and the history behind the time four lps total i often wonder because the label that puts these out they're called parachute um parachute recording company you would think that maybe they would put out like a a four lp box or multi-gate full type package instead they, they just do two separate volumes it does take up a little bit more shelf space but honestly it's down to the quality of the shows and that's why i go after the go after a lot of these releases and uh this is a really great solid 70s yes live recording to add to the collection okay so if you saw my last vinyl haul video from back in february uh chad Kasem of acoustic sounds analog productions and quality record pressings had sent me a copy of alice cooper's welcome to my nightmare to review uh for trackingangle.com and of course it was the atlantic records 75th anniversary pressing all analog 2 lp 45 rpm sounded fantastic and i wrote a very favorable review of the pressing and he had asked if there was anything else that i wanted to review uh for tracking angle that was part of the series and sure enough i took a look at which titles were available and I was able to get another one from Chad. So thank you very much. And it is the self-titled debut of Bad Company, released literally 50 years ago this year, uh, back in 1974. Of course, Bad Company, super group consisting of Paul Rogers and Simon Kirk of Free, Mick Ralphs of Mott the Hoople, and Boz Burl of King Crimson. A great piece of heavy blues rock. On this album, you have Can't Get Enough, Rocksteady, Ready for Love, Moving On. The title track, Bad Company, literally this album almost plays like a, a greatest hits almost. It is so damn good. And this is another 2LP 45 RPM pressing. Now it says here on the bottom, it is indeed 100% all analog, but it was mastered and cut to lacquer from a quarter inch flat tape copy of the original master tape. So they went ahead and used a, um, a tape copy for this pressing, which to be quite honest with you, it sounds very, very solid to my ears. Um, I won't disclose too much about this because obviously you'll have to go on trackingangle.com to uh, read the review, but nonetheless, it sounds absolutely great, and it comes on the classic Swan Song label, Led Zeppelin's record label there, and it is absolutely stunning. And I did have a single LP reissue that was, I believe, cut by Steve Hoffman and Kevin Gray, to the best of my knowledge, which I believe that was also all analog, um, 1 LP, 33 RPM, and that was pretty impressive. And obviously, this is just a, you know, it's a smidge better, I would say. Uh, just given the 45 rpm treatment but seriously really really glad to have this copy in my collection and once again it's thanks to chad Kasem for considering me enough to send me this and to review it for the website okay so here is a brand new release that just came out that i am so excited about that hopefully continues a pattern of paying tribute to the godfathers of metal what exactly am I talking about? I am talking about Zach Sabbath. Now, Zach Sabbath is a band led by Zach Wild, uh, Ozzy Osbourne's guitar player. And uh, it's a trio that consists of him on guitar and vocals, Blasco on bass, and Joey Castillo on drums. And their main mission is to pay tribute to Black Sabbath. 
Now, a couple years ago, they released an album called Vertigo, which is them covering the first Black Sabbath album from start to finish. And honestly, they do serious justice to the original arrangements. They yet make it their own. And it's an absolutely fitting tribute. And it's also, you know, in the family, so to speak, uh, given um, Zach's connection with Ozzy and this and that. So this new album is called Doomed Forever, Forever Doomed. Now, this is a double album that has them covering both Paranoid and Master of Reality in their entirety. Arguably two of Sabbath's finest moments. And I'm super excited about this as well because obviously Master Reality, for those that don't know, is my all-time favorite Black Sabbath record. It's one of those few albums where it's all killer, no filler. It's concise, it's to the point, and it never overstays its welcome. And even though half of the Paranoid album has been overkilled by FM radio, it still stands up on its own as being such a fine album, and the songs themselves are great. Uh, so I am very excited for this. Comes with a nice gatefold design. There's Zach right there. Now there's two versions out there. I have this one here, which is the red variant, which has like the red foil um text on the cover and it does come pressed on red vinyl uh but there is also a purple version which from what i've seen is an extremely high demand simply because purple master reality if you look at the album cover it all kind of ties in so i think for the sake of having everything in line everyone's kind of going for that but with the red it was honestly just kind of getting my hands on what i could get my hands on and honestly at the end of the day it doesn't really matter which variants I have, as long as I have it in my collection, and I cannot wait to spin this bad boy. Okay, so I know I talked about the first solo album of this particular artist in my last monthly vinyl haul video, but this time around, I'm going to be focusing on what is perhaps the best album of the group that this artist was in that coincidentally took the same name as his. What exactly am I talking about? I am talking about Alice Cooper's Billion Dollar Babies. Uh, like I said, this is probably the best Alice Cooper group album. So many classics on here. You have the title track, No More Mr. Nice Guy, Elected, Hello Hooray, Sick Things, I Love the Dead. It is phenomenal from start to finish. And Rhino has just put out this great deluxe edition. Um, very fitting, of course, since the album celebrated its 50th anniversary this past year. And uh, this is actually not the first time Billion Dollar Babies has gotten a deluxe treatment. So back in 2001, there was a two CD version, which all the contents of that deluxe set are featured here, but there's more. Uh, so obviously we have the first LP, which is... Uh, devoted to the album newly remastered which i believe is an all analog cut based on what i heard uh the second lp consists of a live show from texas which was released on that deluxe version it was also done as a record store day release a couple years back and then the third lp features the encores from that show uh, which were not on the 2001 version some studio outtakes and some single versions and edits so it is overall very comprehensive and just the package alone is impressive as hell so as you can see they kind of do like the sort of die cut wallet type design and there's a nice bit of snake skin gloss type finish to it which is really cool and this opens up as a triple gatefold sleeve so this is all new this photo of alice uh the track list and all the credits and other photos and then when you open it up again, this is essentially what the original gatefold looked like back in the day. Th these are the pop-out trading cards, which you could actually pop out, but why would you want to do that to something like this? And of course, let me place this down here just so I can show you guys everything. This does have the billion dollar bill as well. Unfortunately, not a, um, a valid form of US currency, but it's featured here. And the first LP, which is the album, does come housed in the original Prince of Intersleeve that it came in with the lyrics on this side and the group there with the uh, baby analysis makeup and all the money. And I'll showcase at least one of the labels just so you guys can see. It's kind of packed tight in these uh, in this Prince of Intersleeve. I got to get some rounded anti-static ones. But there, as you see, it does replicate the sort of green Warner Brothers label, but instead it says Warner Records. And also, as an added bonus, uh, there is also the inclusion of a very nice booklet, uh, which has a track-by-track -track breakdown of all the tracks on the album, as well as all the live cuts and the studio outtakes. So 
very comprehensive overall and quite a lot to get through uh, as you listen to the deluxe version of Billion Dollar Babies. Okay, here are some more cool cheap finds from VC Vinyl on Whatnot. If you watched my Rolling Stones live video recently, you know exactly what entails with them. This time around, they've been auctioning off some George Harrison titles. And this is not the first time I've gotten George Harrison stuff from VC Vinyl. I think I got my copy of Gone Truppo from them some time ago, and now they got their hands on some more inventory. So who knows if they'll be kind of beefing up with the rest of the, his uh, catalog. Because to be honest, as much as I love George and the stuff that he did with the Beatles, and All Things Must Pass is a phenomenal, phenomenal record. Um, I don't know. I just never felt the urgency to check out the rest of his solo stuff. But for, hey, 10 bucks a piece, why not? So first up, we have Wonderwall Music. Uh, this is technically his first solo album, but it's also a soundtrack album to the film Wonderwall. Uh, this album displays his love for Indian music and raga, uh, very much you know in line with what he was kind of bringing into the Beatles fold around the mid to late 60s. And um, I just find this interesting just because it kind of does reside itself in Beatles history, just because this came out in early November 1968, literally a couple weeks before the White album album so it's interesting how it kind of resides itself in the timeline but uh i think it's because of that is why i've always wanted to check it out and i do also have the electronic music album that he had put out after this one so it's overall interesting stuff but uh this will be my first time also digging into it as well and of course it does come on the apple label as you saw uh with the uh, one side of the printed inner sleeve so Hey, for a blind buy for 10 bucks on a brand new LP, I think that is well justifiable. So we got Wonderwall Music, as well as Somewhere in England. This came out in 1981. Uh, this came out after John Lennon's passing, and uh, George actually pays tribute to John with the song all those years ago. So there's the back, and of course we have another Prince of Dinner Sleeve lyrics and a photo of George and uh this comes on his uh his dark horse label as you can see uh on the center label there so overall pleased to get my hands on two George Harrison albums for 10 bucks each and hopefully there's more to come Okay, so recently Abby and I went on a date out in Ocean City uh in our home state of New Jersey and we stopped by a store that I have been wanting to visit for a very long time, and that is Grassroots, which is predominantly a music instrument shop, but it's one of those shops that also has vinyl records in stock. And honestly, if you're looking for something pretty much simple and relatively easy to find, you will find it there. So the selection, I would say, covered a pretty good scope, um, but I did not manage to leave with one of the cooler things that they had. And it's funny because I had a couple of things in my hand and I asked Abby, I was like, here, you pick which one that I should come home with. And sure enough, she picked the coolest thing that was in my hand. And that is the Cramps Psychedelic Jungle, um, beefing up the Cramps collection. I picked up uh, songs the Lord taught us back when I was out in California. And I almost got this as well, but I didn't want to overdo it on the Cramps. So I figured I would approach this a little bit later on. And now is that time. Notable track on here is uh, Goo Goo Muck, uh, which obviously appeared in the uh, the Wednesday uh, series. So that song kind of blew up because of that. But uh, definitely uh, the last sort of early piece of early Cramps that I needed for uh, the collection. And this is an unofficial press uh, that does come pressed on, I say as I try to get out of the sleeve, sort of Coke bottle clear vinyl, and it's on that illegal records label right there. So overall pretty cool stuff and glad that I'm able to further beef up my Cramps collection. Okay, so here is a brand new album by one of my favorite English bands from the 21st century, a band that I don't think gets enough love here in the States compared to how they are praised in their home country in England, where they're basically filling up arenas and stadiums. I will say my love for this band does have a lot of nostalgic ties uh, to it, uh, because back when I was in middle school, I was literally obsessed with this band. But it is still interesting to see what they explore um, in recent years. And the band that I am talking about is Kaiser Chiefs, and this is their brand new album, the very aptly titled Kaiser Chiefs Easy 8th Album. So this is indeed their 8th uh, studio album, and the recent studio output of the Kaiser Chiefs has been... 
interesting for lack of a better term. Now, this is just, you know, my personal opinion. I do feel that the Kaiser Chiefs sound has been catered around uh, vocalist Ricky Wilson's stature as a British television personality. He was one of the judges on the UK version of The Voice, and he's appeared on Great British Bake Off and a few other shows. So I feel like it has been more slicked back and a bit more synth poppy and commercialized, kind of straying from the sort of post-punk revival kind of roots from when they emerged back in the mid-2000s. Um, Part of me wishes that, you know, they've been together for 20 years, that they would just get back to basics and this and that. But um, you got to commend them for, you know, being in the business for 20 years and still exploring some fresh territory. And they continue to, uh, to do so with this album, kind of veering in a more sort of funk kind of territory. There's a little bit of Nile Rodgers chic kind of influence on this album, particularly the singles, uh, Feeling All Right, How to Dance and Jealousy. But some of the album cuts, such as Beautiful Girl, uh, reasons to stay alive and sentimental love songs do have they kind of let loose a little bit and it's a bit more rocky uh, but let's hope may maybe that the ninth album is a bit more rockier let's just see but until then this is all right but overall pretty standard jacket this does come with a nice printed inner sleeve here there's the kaisers right there that's ricky wilson that's the guy I referenced all the lyrics on this side and this is an indie exclusive pressing which does come pressed on yellow vinyl, which looks pretty nice. So overall, pretty stoked to have the newest studio offering by the Kaiser Chiefs. Okay, so I know I showcased some yes early on in this haul, but now I'm going to shine a light on one of my favorite 70s progressive rock bands. And these recordings that I'm going to talk about have appeared elsewhere on various compilations and box sets over the years, but this is the first time that these recordings have been made exclusively available on vinyl, and that is... Jethro Tull, The Chateau de Harreville Sessions, 1972. So a little bit of backstory behind these recordings. Uh, in 1972, Jethro Tull was planning a follow-up to Thick as a Brick, and they figured they would make that leap from making a single LP concept album to a double LP of shorter songs. So they went ahead and decamped to Paris to make this supposed follow-up, and basically everything that could have gone wrong at these sessions did go wrong. So much so that these sessions were often nicknamed the Chateau Disaster Tapes. So basically they abandoned the recording attempt and they went on to do a passion play and the rest is history. But with all that said, some of these recordings did appear on the passion play album as well as the war child album. And in terms of its release history, some of it appeared on the 1988, um, 20 years of Jethro Tull box set. There was also the nightcap compilation, uh, which a whole disc of these sessions was devoted to. And then most recently, Recently, Stephen Wilson remixed these sessions as part of the 40th anniversary Passion Play box set, and that is exactly the source material for this vinyl pressing. So you have the main 16 tracks from these sessions remixed by Stephen Wilson on sides one to three, and then side four has some sort of representations of how these um, uh, these recordings were represented on, like I said, the 20 Years of Jethro Tull box set, some original 1973 and 74 mixes that appeared on uh, Passion Play and War Child, respectively. So this is pretty comprehensive on the vinyl format, and it's quite interesting to see uh, the Jethro Tull camp uh, push out some of these studio outtakes now on vinyl since they've done the main catalog, and um, they also did the War Child 2 um vinyl pressing recently so it's cool to see them do this sort of lost tall album from the 70s from the golden period of tall basically so as you see there there's the chateau in broad daylight and then here's a sort of nightmarish uh lightning bolt uh rendering on the back side we have some nice in-depth liner notes along with a cool photo of the band from the time frame and the printed inners are really solid too so we have scans of tape boxes and print ads for the studio and some other annotations and just for the sake of showcasing they do come with these interesting center labels uh with photos of the chateau but 
they have a nice sort of green tinge to them to match that green uh, chrysalis label, uh, which looks absolutely tremendous. So I will say it's been a hot minute since I last listened to these recordings. So it's going to be fun revisiting some old tall territory with these recordings. Okay, so we kicked this haul off with a bang. Now we're going to wrap it up with some banging bargains. So banging that this first record I'm going to show you guys typically retails for around 30 bucks. I copped it for $9. And this is one of those cases of right place, right time. And if you're in the right circles and you're aware of a distributor that's facing out their vinyl inventory, you don't waste time and you jump on the opportunity and needless to say, I did. The album I am talking about is King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard Butterfly 3000. This is one of many King Gizzard albums that they have put out over the past couple of years. And interestingly enough, this album has 10 different uh, language variants from for all over the world. Um, and for each of those variants, there's also three colored variants that you don't know which one you get until you pick it up. So there's red, blue, and yellow for 10 variants. So if you do the math, you can only imagine how maddening it is for the hardcore gizzard completists out there that want to get every color for every language. It's absolutely crazy. I just did a random draw and I got my hands on what is considered the Serbian version of the album. And it's just only, they call them language variants because of the way that the lyrics and the titles are all translated to each respective language. It's not like they recorded in those languages, but um, it's interesting, you know, from a collectability standpoint, they obviously know what they're doing because people will flock to this kind of thing. And as you see, they do package their albums kind of uniquely with these sort of, you know, cardboard outer jackets and such. There's the sticker there, which is of course all in Serbian. And then here is the main cover, very psychedelic looking, which is really cool. And there you go. There's the track list all translated there. Nice gatefold jacket featuring the band. And then there's also the, um, Serbian translations of the lyrics on the printed inner sleeve here. And this copy comes pressed on blue vinyl, which to be honest, I like because it matches the blue of the printed inner sleeve. So now because I am getting more into Gizzard with time, I don't think I will go through the extremes of getting the nine other <laughs> language variants. Um, I I'm one of those types uh, with these guys that, you know, one copy is good enough just because I don't want to I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But hey, nine bucks. You can't go wrong. And this next record is another one that I got within the same lot as the um, as the Gizzard stuff that I just showed. Uh, this one I got for $12. And it's funny how this record landed up in my collection. And it's kind of down to a certain comment that I replied to recently on social media. And that is U2's Boy. This is U2's first album. And they are a band, despite the legendary stature uh, and the love that many fans have for this band, this is a band that I don't have any records of. I know the radio hits, you know, I, I've listened to them all the time, you know, growing up, but um, I just never took the deep dive and listened to the catalog. But this album, I particularly really enjoy. I've heard it a lot as of lately. I Will Follow is always one of my favorite U2 songs. Um, Into the Heart is a great track as well. So I figured if, if I was going to seek a U2 album out, it would probably be this one. But it's funny because um, obviously St. Patrick's Day was recently and I did a post and I showcased a Thin Lizzy album, which I think they're the best Irish rock band out there. That's my opinion. Not That's not changing. Uh, and somebody commented, they were like, oh, thank God you didn't show a, a YouTube al album. And I replied back, I said, truth be told, I don't have any U2 albums in my collection. And if you're out there watching this, if you left that comment, times have changed. <laughs> it's crazy. But um, but here it is. Now, this is the Record Store Day Black Friday pricing that came out uh, some time ago. It does come with some cool goodies. Um, you got a giant double-sided poster. You have the main uh, album cover image on the front, and then you have the uh, band portraits featured here on the back. 
And there's also an insert here with lyrics and credits. And this pressing comes pressed on white vinyl. So figured got to start somewhere with uh, U2. So I figured I'd start with the album that I wanted to seek out, which is coincidentally the first. I don't know if I'll go ahead and be a completist when it comes to U2. Um, I feel like the early stuff is where it's at for me. Like this album all the way up until probably Boy. Not not Boy. Uh, War, that album. Uh, but we shall see. Follow this channel for my YouTube journey. <laughs> it's interesting. And then there's also a couple of Hendrix Record Store Day pressings that I got for $5 a piece. Which is honestly not bad for given what the prices of 7 inches are these days. They're not bad whatsoever. This is a really cool one. This is one that I was aware of but I never really saw out in the wild. Uh, this is Burning of the Midnight Lamp. This is a track off of um, Electric Ladyland. And uh, this is a mono sort of EP, which also comes with the tracks uh, Crosstown Traffic and Gypsy Eyes. It is numbered. Number 659. That's a pretty nice low number. And this comes pressed on sort of orange sort of flame colored vinyl with some cool custom center labels there that looks really cool and this came out for record store day back in 2018 and like i've said i've never seen this out and it looks really really cool so i got my hands on this and then here is a record store day release from recent years that i just completely missed and never picked up and that is the message to love and changes seven inch both these tracks from um from Band of Gypsies. This came out back in 2020, and it is also um, hand-numbered as well. This is copy number 2,775 out of 10,650, so I think there's enough of these to go around for, uh, for a lot of people, even those that might be casual Hendrix fans. And uh, this one also, coincidentally, comes pressed on that sort of same... Um, orange colored vinyl this one has a slight sort of like marbled kind of look to it with some flecks of red in there which looks pretty cool so this is really really solid super stoked to have these two hendrix uh seven inches here and then the last record i'm going to show you guys um kind of alludes to the zach sabbath record that i showcased earlier in this haul um this record is obviously by the band that they're paying tribute to. This is a, I say legal bootleg, but this is the weird thing with that sort of circle. Because aside from like broadcasts and things, now they're just putting out just about anything. What do I mean by that? Well, obviously I'm talking about Black Sabbath. And this is Lausanne 1970. This right here is an audience recording that has circulated for a number of years. I have seen copies pop up every now and then on eBay and Discogs. Uh, but right now, this has sort of fallen in the whole sort of legal bootleg circle to where you can get your hands on this. So goes to show that you can find audience recordings out there in the wild kind of more easily than having to lurk through the uh, the dark bowels of, you know, eBay and Discogs. Um, it's a solid audience recording overall, and it's relatively early in their career. I, I don't even think Paranoid was out at this point when this show took place. Uh, but one of the things that I like about it, and I'll show you guys the, uh, the track list here. I mean, obviously it has, you know, the title track, Behind the Wall of Sleep, NIB, Fairies Wear Boots, War Pigs. Um, I like it because they do Sleeping Village and Warning. And I don't have any live recordings of Sabbath playing those early tracks live, along with the song Blue Coat Man. So I think from just a historical early perspective, this is something quite, you know, notable to have in the collection. You do get some cool live shots of the band over the years on the gatefold. And this pressing does come pressed on red vinyl as well. Also, it does go to show that instead of using some weird, interesting choices of artwork... I do like the spooky kind of imagery uh, with this one. Kind of matches the aesthetic pretty well. But um, not too bad of an end to a solid month of vinyl finds. So there you guys go. That is my vinyl haul of all the records that I acquired within the month of March this year in 2024. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead, give it a like, and subscribe to the channel. See you guys in the next video. And most importantly, 
keep the record spinning.